Good afternoon. Can I have your attention, please? Welcome to a special August uh, program of the City Club of Portland. I'm just thrilled to see so many people here today on a day I thought everybody would be staying away from downtown. Uh, it's quite a busy day here in Portland. Um, today's uh, special presentation is Undoing the Obesity Epidemic, Making Connections, Meeting the Challenges with our special guest, United States Surgeon General Richard H. Carmona. And our program today is sponsored by Nike. First, a couple of announcements, which will give our speaker a chance to finish his lunch. There will be no Friday program next uh, week, August 20th, but in two weeks, August 27th, former United States Senator Slade Gorton, who was a member of the 9-11 Commission, will be here to talk about the Commission's recent um, report and recommendations, and that program will be sponsored by Preston Gates and Ellis, LLP. Detail on all club events are available on our website, um, and in our bulletin. The website's address is www.pdxcityclub.org. Um, at, this, at this time, I'd like to um, recognize our membership chairman, Jake Okenberg, to make a special, um, just to make a special pitch about uh, membership in the City Club. Jake is project director for the Oregon Business Council, and he helps coordinate the Oregon Business Plan. He's a member of the club's board of governors, and as I said, he chairs the club's membership committee. So, Jake? In my capacity as, as membership chair as, and as a new board member, they have given me a very, very easy starting task, which is to more than double our membership numbers in the next three years, which was very nice of them. I know many of you are members, and, and to you, thank you for helping us sustain the great work that City Club does in the city and in the state. For those of you who are not members, of which there are many, especially when we have great speakers like we have today, where people from the community want to hear, we ask you to also join us. In the last year, we've had a tremendous amount of success bringing more people into the club. We want to continue that. And I think we've had such success, and we're going to continue doing that because people see the value. We have great forums like we have today. Even on those days where you can't make it here for the Friday forum, you'll be driving along like I do, and then you'll hear a wonderful commentary on the radio and you'll realize it's the Friday Forum being rebroadcast on Oregon Public Broadcasting. The research reports that as I grew up I would read almost, it seemed like every few months there'd be something in the newspaper citing the great work City Club was doing and launching new efforts such as the City Club New Leaders bringing young people into the process and people of all ages. The Citizen Read Book Club. The Issue Committee is doing great work. The Citizen Salon Dinners. There are many things that City Club is doing and they're doing it at a time that is more important than ever for the state of our city, the state of our state, and the state of our nation, engaging people civically in a way that's responsible, in a way that's respectable. And there is no one else doing it quite like it in this city. So I would ask you to take a look at the membership forms that are on your table today. Bring those with you, or better yet, even fill them out today before you leave and hand them to one of the staff members at the back. Thank you so much for helping me in my job and helping all of us sustain the great civic engagement we have here at City Club. Thank you. I want to make a few introductions before I introduce our speaker. Um, With us today, we have um, Dr. David McCarran, who's president of the Portland-based Academic Network. He's working with uh, Nike and other key stakeholders in an initiative called Shaping America's Youth, which has a special emphasis on creating an action plan around the youth obesity issue. I also want to introduce Dr. Mal Cohn, our state ep epidemiologist who's here, uh, who's a huge championship for youth and um, reducing obesity. Also, um, our board host today is Heather Kometz, who is a tax attorney with Sussman Shank and a member of the club's board of governors. And Heather will have the privilege of asking the first question. And so to our program. First, a little bit about our speaker, the United States Surgeon General. Dr. Richard Carmona, I think, came to his um, office um, from an initially remarkable path. Um, growing up in New York City, he dropped out of high school and um, enlisted in the United States Army. He served in Vietnam and was a combat, is a combat decorated veteran of Vietnam. Following active duty, um, having, having obtained his uh, general equivalency diploma, 
Dr. Carmona began his academic training through City College of New York and on to uh, uh, medical school eventually at the University of California in San Francisco where he was um, the top graduate uh, in medical school. He went on to get a surgical residency in trauma, burns, and critical care. And prior to being uh, named Surgeon General, Dr. Carmona was the chairman of the state of Arizona's Southern Regional Emergency Medical System, a professor of surgery, public health, and family and community medicine at the University of Arizona, and the Pima County Sheriff's Department of Surgeon, excuse me, the Pima County Sheriff's Department Surgeon and Deputy Sheriff. I think we're all aware of the profile that the United States Surgeon General plays on public health issues, and, and over the last few decades, Surgeon General has made prominent many important public health issues. Today, Dr. Carmona has made a special um, priority for raising public awareness of obesity, and particularly youth obesity. And it's on that subject that, that he's come here to join us today. So please join me in welcoming today's speaker, Surgeon General Richard H. Carmona. Good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me here today. I understand there's a couple of other minor events going on in the city right now. Well, after those introductions, and this was a rather a shorter one, I always feel I have to explain myself because you're all not feeling very confident that your Surgeon General is a high school dropout. So <clears throat> it is true, but I, I'll tell you that uh, about a month ago, my high school, after 37 years, invited me back and gave me my high school diploma when I, I gave the commencement address. <clears throat> I'll tell you a little bit about me because I think it will help you to understand how I see health and wellness in America and how um, I'm approaching this issue of obesity as well as other health issues in serving in this capacity as your United States Surgeon General. As you heard, I grew up in New York City. Um, very poor family, Hispanic family, Latino kid, oldest of four. My parents both struggled with substance problems. And um, we weren't any different than most of the kids that grew up in Harlem or Washington Heights at the time. And uh, Rich Carmona dropping out of high school was not even noticeable. The fact is, in the hood I grew up in, high school graduation was a reportable event. So it wasn't as if it was a big deal. So it's important, I think, you understand where I come from because a lot of the views I have today about health and wellness are really shaped by my own cultural understanding about my own values, having lived through some of these things that I'm responsible for now. So when I have to deal with issues of, that of socioeconomic issues that relate to health, of poverty and children, of why kids don't learn when they're hungry or they don't have a place to eat, I understand that. I mean, I was one of those kids. I was homeless for the first time at six years old. And if it wasn't that I had a grandmother in a little tenement apartment who took us off the streets, I don't know what would have happened to us. So those are issues that are very near and dear to my heart because I've lived through them. And, and I understand the intersection of socioeconomic issues with health, and especially as it relates to our children. I am very fortunate to have grown up in the United States because there's few places in the world where you can start with those type of beginnings and then become the Surgeon General of the United States. And the fact is, is that this is a land of opportunity, it's a land of wonderment, and to this day I'm still pinching myself for this opportunity that I have, because I'd like to tell you I plan to be Surgeon General of the United States, but the fact is it's a series of fortuitous events that occur and all of a sudden, you're being considered for this position. I was happy just to go to college and graduate from college as the first in my family, let alone go to medical school and do other things. But during those years, as I evolved to become a physician, I had a lot of other jobs because I had to work. As you heard, I've been a soldier. And I might mention, I don't know if he's here. I just This is an incredible story. It wasn't part of my speech. But I was in Special Forces, and I was in an, special operations team in Vietnam and just now as I was sitting in the car in the street a guy knocks on the window and he says Rich hi it's Alan Johnson I hadn't seen him in 34 years he was the engineer on my special forces team in Vietnam in 1969 and 70 Alan are you out there he said he was going to try and come up there he is right there <clears throat> And uh, 
Alan uh, is one of your residents, and when I got the job, he emailed me, and again, I haven't seen him for 34 years. He and uh, our executive officer took me out on my first combat operation, and I just recounted it to him downstairs as a young, fully trained Special Forces uh, sergeant. And we went out, and uh, we took in some fire. And uh, he and the lieutenant said to me, uh, Rich, get a fix on that position. So I stood up with a compass and a map, and I start looking, and all of a sudden, lots of fire started coming my way. And they both looked at me and said, son, it's not training anymore. <laughs> and I always remember, he probably doesn't remember it, but I remember it about him and Lieutenant Burke, who took me out the first time. But many of those experiences shaped my life as a young soldier. I've, and then, of course, I've been, uh, I've been a police officer. I've been a paramedic, worked the streets as a paramedic and as a police officer. Been a registered nurse, a physician's assistant. Finally, being persistent and tenacious, found my way to the medical school and did okay in medical school. But all of those experiences have helped to shape my life, and especially today in the position as the 17th Surgeon General of the United States, where you really have to have a grasp of so many different things, a lot of my personal experiences are as important as the academic experiences or the degree I have in understanding how to deal with very diverse populations where cultural competence is so important and a wide range of activities from the pure medical issues to social and economic issues as I, as I pointed out to you. And as I evolved into this position, again, never expecting to become a Surgeon General, I got a call late one night, over about two and a half years ago from the White House, a young man, a staffer who just called and said uh, on, a, on the voicemail, please give us a call, this is the White House, we'd like to speak to you about a job. <laughs> <clears throat> and I immediately thought of all the police and firemen and soldiers I work with and I knew there was someone out there trying to embarrass me and that this was not a call from the White House. Because you see, I had no political ties and I was not somebody that ran that beltway. So it was truly extraordinary to get a call out of the blue. And as I went through the process to become Surgeon General, after, going, after becoming selected, it was just, every day was a mind-boggling awesome day. Because the first thing I did after I called and I found out legitimately that this was a real call, because my caller ID said 202 with a 456 area code, uh, a number, I mean prefix, and 202 and 456 is the White House, the, the prefix for the White House, and I know it now because I got it on speed dial, but I didn't know it then. <laughs> and the fact is that the first thing I memorized when they said we'd like you to enter the process and I did my application and all of that, I thought, okay, I've got to be able to bow out of this with dignitary, dignity because clearly they are going to reject me. There's no reason. And in fact, I remember my first thoughts were that this proves there's another Rich Carmona in the country. It's not me. <laughs> but I thought, there's no downside. I'm a smart street kid. I'm gainfully employed. They'll find out that it's the wrong Rich Carmona. They'll send me home. I'll still have my job, and I'll go through the process. <laughs> and that's fully how I went into it. In fact, the first thing I memorized was how to be dignified when being rejected, <laughs> to say, Thank you, sir. I appreciate the opportunity to serve my country again and, and so on and so forth. And please call on me if there's anything else I can do. And, and I was it. And each time I'd get a call, I'd, I'd pick it up and I'd be ready. And they'd say, thank you. We'll call you tomorrow or the next day. And I kept going through this process. And finally, they invited me to Washington to meet people that you've heard of, famous people. And I started getting worried because I figured, do I want to work at a place where I've snuck through this far? You know, with and <laughs> my my opinion of the federal government had plummeted. And, <laughs> and, then of course, uh, and then, of course, I go ahead and get the job. And it's a long story in between there, which we don't have time to go into today. But uh, today, I still pinch myself because I just really can't believe, and you know, only in America, really. But um, the president gave me some, an unbelievable opportunity to serve my country again in uniform. And I bring a lot of tools to that position, many of which my predecessors had uh, in academics, but also a lot of experience from life. The challenge then was, what do you do as Surgeon General? Once you get through all of the um, pomp and circumstance and that first day at the White House when uh, the President introduces you to the public and we went into the Oval Office and he said, Rich, be calm. This is, we do this all the time. I said, yes, sir. He said, now here's how it's going to go. This is run of show. 
over the loudspeakers in a, in a minute, you're going to hear what we call the two-minute drill. They're going to start playing Hail to the Chief. And he looks at me and he says, now, that's for me. <laughs> and I say, yes, sir, I understand. And he says, we're going to walk down this hall and take a right, and we're going to go into the green room, and the cabinet's there, and all the members of the national press. And he said, so it's going to be kind of pretty awesome, but everything's going to go fine. You stay on my left shoulder, and Secretary Thompson's going to stay on my right shoulder, and I'm going to be right in the front on the point, and there'll be a couple of Secret Service guys here. And he said, just ignore them. They're there, they're, they're not a problem. And the Marine Band will be over here. So as he stood in front of me, and we were getting ready to go, I looked down, and he had a cuffed pants on, and, and the cuff was stuck under his heel. So I said, just a minute, just a minute. And I bent down, and I freed up the, the cuff that was stuck on his heel and fixed it. And Secretary Thompson looked at me and says, Carmona, you're going to do real well in this administration. <laughs> <laughs> and there began my career as Surgeon General. In any event, though, what does the Surgeon General do? And the Surgeon General, by statute, is responsible to protect and advance the health of the nation. And today, it's health, safety of the nation because of the new threats that have been thrust upon us. Now, I'll just briefly run through the portfolio because I want to spend most of the time on one portion of that portfolio, which falls under prevention, this obesity thing, but I want to let you know the spectrum of issues that I deal with. And in hammering those out, I spoke a lot to my predecessors who are still around. Some you've heard of, Surgeon General Satcher, Surgeon General Coop, Novello, and others, to kind of get a lay of the land, if you will, so I could understand what I was getting into, develop some continuity from Surgeon General David Satcher, a friend and a wonderful man, to make sure that no programs fell through the cracks. But I also got an understanding of what they each had to go through as Surgeon General, how difficult the job it was to try and keep public health above the fray, above the crossfire in the Beltway, every day, from both sides. I learned about the problems they had with trying to move a public health agenda forward in a very politically charged and sometimes partisan environment. Extremely difficult to do. So you try and stay above the fray. <clears throat> so when I had my discussions with the President and the Secretary, I was armed with slides and PowerPoints and papers and ready to make a case for a very robust portfolio as to what the evidence dictated the Surgeon General should do. I was elated to find out that not only did I need not make the presentation, but they had done their homework and basically fully agreed and were willing to empower me in that direction, and hence the portfolio I received. And the portfolio first, and this is not all encompassing, but it really outlines where I spend most of my problems, uh, most of my time on problems, if you will. But as you know, every day things pop up and you have to move. But this is where I spend most of my time in this portfolio, and the first is prevention. We are largely a treatment-oriented society. Our payment systems, our physicians, our nurses, our practitioners are trained to wait until people get ill, and then we compensate them for doing wonderful jobs to make somebody better. Now, again, I reflect on my own life when I look at that for prevention. As a poor kid, we talk about health disparities now. I was one of those health disparities. I hardly ever got timely care. I have far too many cavities in my mouth today that the Army fixed when I was 17 and 18 but because we didn't get care in a timely fashion. I know how health relates to schooling and, edu and, and homelessness and hunger, so I understand that mix, because having lived it. When I look at the prevention side otherwise, and I look at the disease burden we have in society, which is considerable, we spend nearly 15% of our gross national product on health care. We have a huge disease burden. Most of it is preventable. And I think back to working as a trauma surgeon, or a paramedic, or as a police officer, picking people off the streets, bringing them into the ER, and in fact, as a, as a nurse, when I was a nurse. But then as a EMS director and trauma surgeon, much like my boss, who's, my former boss, who's here at your Oregon Health Sciences Center, Don Trunkey, who I trained under for many years. Every day, the gurneys rolled in, and my team and I would take the best science in the world and resuscitate somebody because they made a bad mistake that day, drinking and driving, smoking, domestic violence, drugs, alcohol, crime, whatever it happens to be. But we were expected to harness the best science available, focus it on that person in a moment in time, resuscitate them, operate on them, put them in the ICU, put them in the ward, put them in rehabilitation, 
and some time later they come out the other end, probably not whole, but physically working, we send them back out. But, but what do we do for their mind? What do we do to change the behavior that brought them there in the first place? Little or nothing. And society bears that cost because largely toward the end of my clinical career, I used to joke with my fellows and interns and residents and medical students and say, well, I don't really feel like a trauma surgeon. I am a repairer of society's indiscretions. That's what I do. I put people back together that make bad decisions and live dysfunctional lives because most of what I cared for in an acute setting were people that made bad decisions. And some of them were for all of their life. Inactivity, eating rat bad, you know, the wrong foods, engaging in high risk activities. So it doesn't make a difference which path you took to get there. All those paths were paths that were preventable. And we, as society, bear the burden of the cost and the disease burden on society. So we are a treatment-oriented society, and one of my goals is to start moving that pendulum back with my colleagues, many of whom you see here, to a prevention-oriented society. Having lived the experience, having the academic education, I feel comfortable because I really do understand those issues. The second issue that is very important to me and my colleagues is the issue of preparedness. No Surgeon General has had to deal with these type of issues before. Prior to 9-11, we talked about all hazards preparedness. That is, earthquakes and hurricanes and floods and making sure that public health infrastructure was there to deal with the public health consequences of bad things because, as many of you know, public health consequences of war and adversity generally far outweigh the bombs and the bullets and the physical injuries. We lose a lot more people from infection and dehydration and malnutrition and so on and more than we do from getting shot. And that includes Vietnam and Korea and the Second World War. Okay, and probably the wars we're engaged in now. So we forget the importance of public health. So on the preparedness side though, the challenge for me and my colleagues now is 9-11. Who could have ever thought that we'd think of planes as weapons? Who could have ever thought that we'd think of germs or pathogens as weapons? And now they are. How do we educate, build capacitance and resilience into the biggest practice in the world, my practice, 290 million people. How do we make people understand this new world order and prepare themselves for it in real time as the threat is looming over us for the next event? An extraordinarily difficult task. We're working the best we can, but in my lifetime, I don't think we're ever going to be satisfied we're there because we who have been in the field for a long time recognize that our goal is to stay a step or two in front of our adversaries because as we develop something, they're going to develop something else. And the real issue is how do we eradicate terrorism and then the tools of the terrorists, the weapons of mass destruction may go away. But that's a very complex issue far beyond the scope of this that we try and deal with every day on your behalf to make our country safer. The third issue in that portfolio, prevention, preparedness, number three, health disparities. The President and the Secretary felt very, very strongly that we must do something to level the playing field. The fact is, in this country, people of color typically have less access to health care and have poorer outcomes, even if they have access to health care. Why is that? Ton of scientific information that will explain that. Multifactorial etiology, there's not one reason for it, but as a society, we have to recognize that our systems don't treat everybody the same way, don't allow access for everybody. And one of the things we want to try and do is level that playing field so that all people, whether you're on an Indian reservation or in the ghetto in an inner city or living in wealth in the foothills in some city, have similar access, similar care, and similar outcomes when we look at that. That's health disparities. And of course, as you can imagine, it's important to me because, again, I was one of those health disparities. And I understand what it's like not to have health care and to be hungry and to be homeless and so on. So it's something that I feel passionately about as does the President, as does the Secretary, but it is a monumental task because how do you get that best science, programmatically or otherwise, in the communities in a culturally competent manner in hopes of changing behavior? Because that's what this is all about. Part of disparities is that cultural divide. What makes us strong in the country, the melting pot, Ellis Island, the hundreds if not thousands of ethnicities we have also divides us not just in language, but in understanding how people see health and people see death and dying in our country. So it's absolutely important that we understand 
diversity, we understand health disparities, and we understand the value of cultural competence in delivering our messages uniquely to each and every society that needs it, part of our society that needs it, because one size doesn't fit all. The last area that we've just introduced within that portfolio of three is health literacy. Health literacy is taking the knowledge we have as scientists and delivering it to all of our populations who need it, as well as all of our practitioners. We are largely a health illiterate society. How do I know that? Once in a while when I get to go to the store and shop, I can't read the food label. I'm trying to figure out what they're saying, how many grams of what, and per teaspoon, per, per ounce, per 16 ounces. Well, how does the average person figure that out? If these good guys on the table here and many of you who practice in this area say, be healthy, eat the right foods, how, what's right? How many grams of this should I have? What's the difference? What's a trans fat? What's a cis fat? I mean, it's extraordinarily complex. And boy, God help you if you're up in the middle of the night watching the infomercials, because they have an answer to everything. I mean, I sit there at night thinking, why do I work out? If I just take this pill, I can look like Mr. America. You know, I don't have to work out. Or sleep with these electrodes on, and, <laughs> and they will stimulate your body. But, but the average person who's home struggling and is struggling with the weight, struggling with poor health, and sees the magic pill, sees the magic box, and they spend their last few dollars because they think that's going to make them healthy. And there is, we learn there's no magic bullet. It really isn't. You know, what we need to do more of for those of us who are gaining the weight is this at the table instead of this, and get out and move every day. Real simple for all of us. So health literacy, how do we communicate those messages? And we're not doing a good enough job, and we have to raise health literacy in our country. Now, we'll look at that in context. Obesity is a big problem because obesity right now is about to eclipse smoking as the single largest preventable cause of death in the United States. Smoking takes 440,000 people's lives every year. I just issued the 28th Surgeon General's report in May on the, on the health consequences of smoking. The first one was released by my predecessor, Surgeon General Luther Terry, in 1964. Forty years later, still just under a half a million people a year are dying from tobacco-related causes. And that doesn't tell you how many people have cardiac disease and strokes and atherosclerotic, and so on and so forth, and, and they live, but significantly impaired. Huge cost to society. What I'm telling you now is obesity is about to eclipse it, probably this year when we look at the epidemiologic trends. And what that means, right now we see about 400,000 people a year dying from obesity-related diseases. Two out of three Americans are overweight or obese. Much of the diabetes, the type 2 diabetes in our society is preventable because it's linked to your weight. In adults, you say, well, okay, I choose to live that way. We got nine million children in the country now who are overweight or obese. Many of them are developing type 2 diabetes. When I was a young doctor in school, you would be hard pressed to find a child with type 2 diabetes. Now there's hardly a pediatric practice in the country that doesn't have children who have diabetes that are related to weight. And now we're starting to see the first scientific reports of children with hypertension and diabetes and obesity. So what we're doing is we're growing kids and they're developing diseases that in the, in the old days they didn't see for 30 or 40 years. So think about that as you project out to the future and you say, what will our population look like when these youngsters today are the middle age, when they are sitting here in the city club. We'll largely have a population, overweight or obese, with unprecedented rates of diabetes, accelerated cardiovascular disease, higher incidences of cancer. Can we afford that? It's devastating. And so when I speak on this, it's hard to get traction because when I present it to the press, they want to talk about terrorism. They want to talk about the war. They want to talk about other things. So at one press conference I was at, we talked about various aspects of terrorism. I kept trying to go back to a public health agenda. And finally, one reporter made a mistake and said, Dr. Carmona, Surgeon General, what is the biggest problem that you deal with today? And I said, obesity. And it, it was dead silent, just like here. Everybody looked, and the reporters, they didn't have any questions to ask because they were all asking about war and terrorism and weapons of mass destruction. And one reporter says, well, what do you mean? What does that have to do with this? I said, well, obesity is the terror within. I said, we're losing 400,000 people a year, and 9 million children are overweight. And they're like, think of them as little time bombs waiting to have catastrophic consequences. Okay? So on 
We have 3,000 souls who died, some of whom were my friends, when planes hit buildings. And that was a tragedy. It was catastrophic. 3,000. But I'm telling you, 400,000 die every year. And 9 million children are in the pipeline for that catastrophe. What are we doing? Why aren't we mounting as vigorous a response in our country to protect our children and even our older people who need to have this change? We cannot afford the economic burden. We cannot afford the disease burden in society. So for every reason, we must break that cycle. Because if we let it go on, the burden, the legacy that we leave to our children will be unsustainable. They cannot afford the health care because it's going to be layered on what we have already. What about the workforce in the future? If that is the pipeline, where will our firemen, policemen, EMS providers, soldiers, sailors, Marines come from? Where will the military, where will everybody who needs physically active, healthy young men and women, where will they get those people from? They're going to have to do a lottery because there won't be many of them out there. So this is truly catastrophic, and I cannot underscore how important this is. The good news is we have an understanding as to the etiology or causes, the multifactorial nature of this problem. The remedy is simple. Stay physically active in whatever you do and eat a balanced diet. Health literacy coming in there because it's up to us to explain what is that balanced healthy diet? What constitutes appropriate physical activity? At the federal level, we have research programs unprecedented at NIH looking at the issue of obesity, more funding this year to ferret out more of that multifactoriality. We have many programs. Uh, you've probably seen the VERB program. This morning I was uh, at the Boys Elliott uh, Elementary School and we had our VERB truck out there and talking with the kids and the VERB program is a wonderful program. It's simple. Pick an activity, kids, a verb. Basketball, football, running, swimming, dancing. Stick with it. Do something every day. And the verb program supports that. Pick something you want to do. We're not trying to make every kid an athlete. We're not trying to make him a competitive athlete. But get out there and move in whatever you do every day. A perfect example is the partnerships that have been formed in your community here with Nike and the biking and walking groups, the school districts, law enforcement, I mean, everybody's coming together, and Nike's funded some of these programs. President, myself, the secretary, we realize we can't do this alone. It's really about public and private partnerships, bringing everybody together. Because you know what? Every single one of us has a stake in every one of those children in this community and all other communities. My job is to just bring the message, like you're allowing me to do today. But this is a wonderful model that we see here that I hope can be exported around the country because it's the grassroots, it's the local people getting up and recognizing the problem and fixing it uniquely in their own communities. President and I, when I speak, we all we know that you know we're federal employees. We get to pass through, serve our country for a little while, but we recognize that the strength of the country is not the federal government, it's the people, it's the communities. It's all of the activism at the grassroots level that says, I'm not going to tolerate this anymore. I'm going to fix it. And that's what we've seen here in Portland. I've seen for the last years, this is my second time here, and seeing the programs that are rising to address a need in the community. The partnerships are so important. We have the Shaping America. We've got Dr. McCarran up here. Shaking America's Youth, which is American, uh, American Academy of Pediatrics, the McNeil Nutritionals, Campbell's, a number of other corporations. And so, I'm shameless on this. I'll go to anybody in corporate America or public or private and I'll say, I need your help. So I've talked to Coke and Pepsi and, and McDonald's and Nike and everybody and say, help us. Because you all have keys to this puzzle. Some of you have the nutrition part. Some of you have the activity part. So all of us working together can help to reshape how we see health and wellness in our country. Change us from a treatment-oriented society to one that embraces health and wellness and sees disease as an unusual occurrence because we are focusing on health and wellness. That's what's important. Now, it's not easy. I have four children. I'm Surgeon General. They don't listen to me. <laughs> the fact of the matter is that we have many single parent families. We have people struggling working two jobs with kids. No question it's difficult. And then parents say to me, well, I'd like my kid to go to school walking, but it's unsafe. I don't want to take a chance. It's not like when I was a kid that you just left and went to school or riding your bike. 
But the partnerships that we have here with Nike and the walking and biking groups and others are addressing those issues because there are best practices that we've seen emerge around the country that can have kids walk to school safely. If you think innovatively how to make that happen, ride their bikes safely and make that a habit. It helps the pollution, stops us. you don't need as many school buses, you don't need as many cars, it helps the kids stay physically fit. I mean, there's no negative downside. But I recognize the difficulties in reshaping our thought process and our culture because every parent, that's your most precious possession and you don't want to take a chance. But each community can figure out better ways. And we have to think out of the box in the future as we design our new cities. As cities grow and we see streets moving in certain directions and we're talking about public health, are the city architects at the table? Are people who are going to build and plan the city there? Are we talking about sidewalks and lighting and adequate surfaces for senior citizens as well as children who want to walk, bike, skate, etc.? We've got to think things differently now. But it's all within our reach. You all have started doing that already with the wonderful programs you have here. New York has done it. Chicago's doing it. Southern California. So we see them popping up, these islands of excellence. We've got to each work together, get those best practices to be able to do that. Many other partnerships have emerged also, boys and girls clubs, Coca-Cola company, crafts, other food uh, distributors and food makers. All of these are supporting programs in their communities to make our children healthier, to make our children safer, and to help to turn from a prevention-oriented society, a treatment-oriented society, to a prevention-oriented society. The good news is we understand the problem. The good news is we have the tools to make these changes. The bad news is it's going to be intergenerational because even if we make a decree today and all of us decide to change our eating habits and walk more, swim more, bike more, work out more, whatever it is, <clears throat> us older folks will get some incremental benefit because people who stop smoking today, even if they're 70 or 80, get a benefit. People who walk, start walking, people who start doing some resistance training and so on get a benefit. But the real benefit will be that our children start seeing the culture change. And you all who are parents, your children will grow up being physically active, eating healthy. And as their parents, their children then will know no other way because they will grow up in an active environment of people who practice good health practices. So the bad news is it's an intergenerational endeavor. What we are trying to do today and sustain is a legacy for our children and a legacy for the future so that our country can become a healthier nation and one that doesn't have such a disease burden and a huge economic burden on it because we cannot sustain this. We can't, it's prohibitive to think we want to transfer this legacy to our children. It is unsustainable. So in closing, this job of Surgeon General has turned out to be a whole lot tougher than I thought. I got to tell you, you know, you come to Washington and um, you have a clear conscience, you have a good heart, you're going to serve your country again, and you have the passion of a fourth year medical student. You land in Washington and you think, okay, I'm going to stamp out disease and famine and pestilence in one year. And then I'm going to start thinking what I'm going to do next year, <laughs> you know? And then you, you run into those um, complexities of politics and the, the combat zone of the Beltway. I often joke with my colleagues from the military that uh, although having been in combat before, that I probably feel least safe these days <laughs> in the combat zone of, uh, of the Beltway. It's a very difficult environment to get things done because there's so many different stakeholders. So as I think of my own legacy, I, I hope that as I move forward, um, that when my time in office is over, whenever that may be, that the Secretary and the President can look back and feel that their faith in me has been reaffirmed by my actions and that I serve the American public well that all of you that I serve as your United States Surgeon General could look back on my tenure and think he served us well, he was an honest broker, did the job, took care of us, stayed above the fray. And the third group which is new to this position is the global community I now serve because the threats before us don't know any geopolitical borders, whether it's SARS, whether it's terrorism, whatever. And I spend as much time on global issues now and so the global community, the world I serve, understands that I understand the importance of the United States as part of a bigger world and the fact that 
I understand and embrace the concepts of diversity and how we fit into the rest of the world and the health of our country as well as the rest of the world. Thanks very much. Wow. We have the opportunity for questions for our speaker. Also for our other panelists, Dr. McCarran and Dr. Kahn. Uh, questions of the speakers are a privilege for City Club members, so as Jake pointed out, membership forms are on your table. The <laughs> so write it out quickly. <laughs> Again, the privilege of the first question goes to Heather Kometz, member of the Board of Governors. I wanted to ask you about some of those complexities you addressed at the tail end of your speech, um, particularly in regards to how public policy affects your ability to do your job well or not do your job well. A recent book written by New York Times reporter David K. Johnston called Perfectly Legal addressed the issue of obesity like this. He said the cost of food and clothing fell by so much that in 2001 they took up just 18 cents on each dollar of the average family's income down from 26 cents per dollar in 1972. He addressed why that was for clothing and then went on to explain it for food. The government stimulated lower food prices through tax breaks and subsidies, especially to sugar, corn, and cattle operations. These policies encouraged overproduction that filled the supermarkets, fast food joints, and school cafeterias with so much cheap sugar, grease, and starch that Americans spent a shrinking portion of their incomes on food but obesity and diseases associated with them became common. My question is what you think of this sort of an analysis and how you might better perform your job if somehow or another there was a better way to integrate public policy to see the probable and improbable outcomes on each side of them. Well, you, it's, it's a, this is a great, great question and uh, probably should be the subject of a graduate seminar because it, it really is it really speaks to the untoward consequences of policy. And it's one of the most difficult things when you are sitting developing policy and saying, how should we move? And there's 100 stakeholders around the table who all have some vested interest and not, don't, don't take my farm away. No, and if you don't want me to grow that, you're going to have to pay me for it, and so on and so forth. And the health people sitting there and saying, well, what will happen if he grows more or less of that? Now, the link that we haven't established is, and I understand this study is, even though that occurred, we don't know that there's a cause and effect, okay? So we have to make sure that we understand that we're not saying because of this policy this happened, but certainly it happened around the time, and researchers would look and say, is there a cause and effect? Did we, in fact, drive people to eat more bad food because of this policy? The fact is that I'm certain that no one sat at the table in formulating the policy and saying, we're going to make America fat. Okay, they were, that's why I say it's an untoward consequence of the policy. And that's why it's really important that when policies such as these are made, that health professionals like these gentlemen sit at the table who can think through the health-related consequences that may not be appreciated by somebody who's looking only at business, for instance. It's extraordinarily difficult to, uh, to do that. But you're absolutely right that we have to spend a lot more time thinking through our primary policy and the consequences of that, and also some mechanism that we routinely revisit policy, because we're not perfect, and at some point we may see that there is an untoward consequence and we have to go back and fix it. Okay? Thank you. City Club member. Uh, as you alluded to, um, where we put our dollars is where we place our priorities. And here in Oregon, uh, I'm noticing that our, with high schools and elementary schools, our fiscal policy is leaning towards teaching our students to take standardized tests, where after school athletic programs are being cut or students are being charged. You know, when I was in high school, I think I paid $50 to play as many sports as I wanted over the course of a year, where now 
at my high school here in town, it's $300 per sport. And isn't that setting the priority, saying this isn't as important, and students who may need the athletic exercise are really being forced away from developing these healthy habits. And I'd just like to get your thoughts sure. and ideas on that. Your point's well taken. It's something that uh, I've been involved in indirectly because every once in a while I'll get a call and somebody will say, well, Surgeon General, you need to pass a law that kids can do physical, do uh, participate in, in sports at schools and they don't have to pay for it. Well, first of all, I have no statutory authority. So <laughs> there's nothing, being, but, but you know, the, the, when, when things apparently fail in a community, we start getting letters and calls and saying, we want a law, we want regulation. And of course, in relating to your point, you want to be careful what you ask for, because I don't, I don't know how, how you all feel, but I, I don't want the government in my everyday, everyday decision making. You know, I, I want the government involved in certain things, but I don't want them telling me a lot of things. And so I think that we have to achieve a balance. What I have done is to meet with national organizations that are responsible, like school board administrators and superintendents of schools, because largely the issue that you are speaking of is a local issue. The priority is determined by the school board. And obviously they have fixed funds and they have competing interests, I understand. But really, the determination as to what gets funded, what classes are there, if they eliminate physical activity, which is one that I've been involved in, because there is a policy with an untoward consequence. If you look at the trend in the last couple of decades, many schools have eliminated physical activity. And they thought, well, we'll save some money, the kid will just play at home. It doesn't happen. They sit in front of the TV for four hours. And what we have now is an obesity epidemic. So there's another untoward consequence of a policy that wasn't appreciated at the time. So I think it's very important, the issue that you're bringing up, but I, I believe that each community has to deal with that because it's the school boards that have the authority to hire teachers, fire teachers, implement programs, do away with programs. But I've gone on record, I'm a firm believer, that we cannot and we should not eliminate physical programs from our, from our schools. You guys want to comment? Please. I really don't have much to add. I think that uh, there's an enormous there's enormous room for activity around this at the local level and spurring that kind of activity, raising the awareness so that that activity will happen and uh, people will go to their local school boards and make these changes happen is a really important piece of what's ahead of us. And I would just add that the database which we've been able to develop in Shaping America's Youth and largely in part of uh, Dr. Kimona's support of that, the Academy of Pediatrics, Nike and others, really shows very strong evidence that uh, while there are issues in the school, if we don't take this really down to young families, toddlers, and preschool children, because this is where these norms are established, and this is an issue of social norms, it's not a medical issue. It's classic for us as doctors. We get saddled with the problem after it's fixed, and we can't do much about it except sort of bring the patient back. And we're going to have to bring it down to the community, Dr. Kamarna's part, point, and I think that's possible. My name is Greg Raisman, and I'm a City Club member, and um, I'm really glad that you're talking about these things, because I think they're going to have positive impact on other health issues, which are motor vehicle collisions. Um, about 50,000 people in our country are dying from that every year. And uh, The Federal Highway Administration used CDC data this year to say that it's the number one killer of every age group from 2 to 33. So there's a real perception out there that getting to school by walking and biking is unsafe, and it's really ironic that it's driving it into an even more unsafe environment because it drives people to drive. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, historically, the federal government has really spent a lot of money on uh, kind of major projects and major transportation projects. And I'm wondering what type of conversations that you've been hearing about or been involved with to start to get the federal government more heavily involved in some of the smaller connections and smaller types of facilities that are really going to be the key to make the environment safer that these kids are traveling in when they get to school. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll start and I'll, I'll pass it over to my colleagues. Um, at the federal level, um, the group you're speaking of, the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, is run by uh, a gentleman named Dr. Jeff Runge. Dr. Jeff Runge is an emergency physician who's taken care of trauma for most of his life. And he's as passionate about that as I am because he sees the end result. 
uh, we've been working together to reduce highway fatalities and highway injuries through many programs that are similar to the ones we've spoken about today, making the highway safer, construction, bringing the architects and road planners in, speed, seat belts, helmet laws, I mean, all of those things to reduce morbidity and mortality. Uh, and, and as new cities, streets, highways are being designed, making sure that the health professionals are at the table with the architects, with the road planners, and so on, that we make sure we have a comprehensive look before the policy is developed as to what we're going to do. So we are in the process of, of, of doing all of those things right now. Gentlemen. I think, again, there's a uh, room for an enormous amount of activity on this, these kinds of planning issues and engineering issues at the local level. And uh, we in public health need to elbow our way to the table around these kinds of discussions. I know it's been my experience as we've tried to do this either at the state level or try to help folks at the local level do this, that there is something of a cultural divide here. We don't even really speak the same language many times as the planners and architects and so forth who are in many ways involved in making decisions about land use planning and road construction and so forth. So we need to educate ourselves so that we can effectively have that kind of dialogue and uh, have an effect on those sorts of policies. Chris Allman, City Club member. Fifteen years ago, I started an endocrinology fellowship at Harbor UCLA, and we shared our uh, discussions with pediatric endocrinologists. One of the patients we talked at that time about, which was very exotic, was a young Hispanic girl who had diabetes, who was obese, and it felt so uncomfortable to the other endocrinologists, pediatric endocrinologists, to call it type two. They called it type one and a half. So um, right. clearly that was the tip of the iceberg. Um, my question for you um, is that I think policy can be very much a part of our school system in that um, the diet that kids confront in cafeterias and with soda pop machines and junk food that are used as fundraisers and whatnot mm -hmm. has to be changed. There has to be policy that is better constructed such that our kids know what's a healthy diet, what are right portions, and what they too can share with their parents as they learn in health class. And can you can comment on that, please? Yes, you bet. Um, well, you've touched on two issues there. Uh, one is the health literacy issue, and that we have to start that education process in our children from a very early age as to what constitutes appropriate physical activity and an appropriate diet. The issue of the vending machines has been one that's been near and dear to my heart because when um, this, a number of places in the country were trying to figure out what to do with this, we started receiving letters and calls that, again, Surgeon General, you should pass a law that you know, bans machines. And we looked at it and we looked at the literature and we said, well, you know what? There's really nothing inherently wrong with the machine. What are we putting in the machines? And we started looking at what's in the machines. And then when we actually looked at what's happening, many of the schools obtain funding for their physical activity programs, for their libraries, for their bands, from those machines. So then you start to see, then again, it really becomes a very local problem. It's not a federal issue. But I went out and I started meeting with the school district boards and others to try and talk to them about this. And rather than legislate a remedy where a state legislature says, you know, it's a misdemeanor to have a, a machine in school, we'll arrest you for that, I mean, which is absurd, in my opinion. I so said, let's, let's put some stakeholders together at the table and decide how we might do this for the keeping the revenue that you need, but yet making it healthy for our kids. So what we started to see in the last year or so is machines are having fruit, machines are having vegetable snacks, carrot bags, things like that, juices. So, I mean... It's not a perfect remedy yet, but I think the right people need to look at what the best solution is for the community. I'm a firm believer that the federal government can't come up with one solution for this entire country. It's got to be community by community, and my job is to raise the health literacy in the community to make sure they understand what the issues are, what the consequences of any decision might be, and then help that community make their best decision. Gentlemen. I would endorse everything that Dr. Carmona has just said and add that one of our objectives in Shaping America's Youth is to call together across this country in national town meeting-like settings, talking to thousands of people about what can be done in our community and let them speak. Let's talk about it. 
because I agree completely. You cannot come down from a state government or national government level and dictate these things. Children make those choices with those machines, and they make a choice based upon what they have seen in their home, outside the home, and we have to recognize this. A lot of our effort is focused on the school right now, and I can assure you from what I understand, if we continue to focus solely on the schools and vending machines and absence of PE, we will not have thinner children 10 years from now. It starts in the home, in the community, at the youngest age. I think I would respectfully disagree with both the, of the speakers here. <laughs> and I, okay. I, I believe very strongly that there is a role for policy here, not that every single detail about what goes into that vending machine uh, ought to be dictated from the federal or state level, but there really is a role for some guidelines and some collective action about this, because after all, we've gotten in this mess by not having any sort of collective action about this by sort of letting this local process kind of brew on its own. I would caution though, and I guess here I agree with both of the speakers, that I think this is a much more complicated issue than it might appear at first blush. Uh, our State Department of Education here in Oregon has uh, convened a task force to look at these issues, and I'm really very encouraged by this. Um, they have convened a group of stakeholders from across the spectrum. And uh, while it may not go quite as far as I, as state epidemiologist, might want it to go, uh, I'm confident that something positive is going to come out of that, some positive movement uh, around this issue in terms of state-level policy and guidance for schools uh, around what they should be doing. But you know, when you take an issue like the money part of this, it's not at all clear to me that schools necessarily are even making money off of these things. I mean, it seems like they are, right? If they get a, a certain cut of that revenue or if they get some sort of signing bonus, for example, around the issue of pouring contracts, some of you may be familiar with this uh, particular issue. It seems like a lot of money that the school can point to and say, yeah, we're, we're getting this chunk of cash. But the reality is that every time a child buys a drink, say, from that vending machine, that's one drink that they're not buying from the school food service. So there's a loss of revenue to balance that out. And I, I, I just think this is a lot more complicated and needs a, a much more thoughtful and careful analysis. Probably the situation in every district is different. Every district has different kinds of arrangements with the folks who are in the schools. But uh, I think that deserves from some further analysis. And finally, I would say that, you know, um, uh, we do have a problem with school funding. You know, it's a struggle. It continues to be a struggle uh, for us, as I think in many states around the country. Uh, and the question is, you know, do we uh, mortgage our children's health by serving these kinds of foods uh, in order to pay in the short term for some of these things that we're, we're doing at school? I think that's a very important public policy issue. And how we draw that line and, and frame that is going to be very, very important in, in the next year or two. Thank you for your question. Let me make a, a quick comment just on that. I, 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 I agree with everything you said, that the issue is where should the policy emanate from? Is, is it local, is it state, or is it federal? And uh, I think that it really needs to start at the local level because each community is different. And as we've learned in graduate school, very rarely is there one solution that fits all sizes for the whole country. Uh, and, and where uh, my, my opinion is, where there's a failure, where communities fail to connect or can't protect them, then maybe there's a role for government to step in and say, okay, we need to protect the public now. They haven't done it themselves. But I don't think we've been in the debate long enough because it's really still in its infancy, as the doctor just pointed out, as Dr. Cohn just pointed out, as far as ferreting out all of the issues that are involved. It's not as simple as machine yes, machine no. It is really an extraordinarily complex issue. I think all of us have witnessed the confusion of nutrition in this country. Uh, some of you may know of my background, and I've been in the middle of one of those debates for 25 years. The science is still evolving, and the, even the notion of labeling things good or bad is a, without the science to support it is very dangerous, and we could head in that direction. But guidelines, national action plan points, these we can come up with. We can give guidance to the communities as to the choices they needed to discuss and act on. I'm afraid we only have time for one more question. I'm sorry, Ray. Chris? Chris Smith, club member, uh, 
Dr. Carmona, I had the chance to hear you last year at Walk 21 when you were here in Portland. Uh, thank you. You're always as informative as you are engaging. Um, obviously, I have some personal experience with obesity. I'm interested in sort of the, the question of how we think about obesity culturally, uh, whether it's a disease versus uh, the result of a set of personal choices. Um, you know, I know that my choices affect my weight. I think my friends here at City Club know that I'm a pretty goal-directed and focused person, yet managing my weight is the hardest thing that I do in my life, probably. So uh, what's the most productive way for us to think about that as a culture as we try and attack this problem? Well, I, I think that's a great question, the, the, the cultural or sociological implications of, of this issue. First of all, as a society, we need to stop stigmatizing obesity. And, and I think it is a huge problem in our children, because children who are overweight and going to school get ostracized right away. They're not involved in physical activities. They're not the cool kids. They're not the ones that get invited to the parties. And if they stay with that weight for a period of time, that follows them through college, you know, high school and college. And so all of the social interactions that you hope your children to have maybe don't occur. They're not participating in sports. They tend to uh, not want to show up in public depending on the degree of the problem that they have. So as a society, you know, we um, don't do so well with things like obesity. Mental health is another one that you know, we marginalize uh, and we stigmatize. So hence, we really struggle with not only paying for it, but having a system that embraces people who have depression or have other mental problems. And so obesity, I think we start, need to start thinking of as a, as a significant issue. And I think it's one that lends itself again to health literacy. We have to educate the American public that this is a problem before us. And whether we call it a disease or not, the important thing is, is that we recognize that people don't want to be fat or obese. They're having a problem. And when we look at why they have a problem, as you know, there's a spectrum. There's some with endocrine problems. And more commonly, it's people who are just eating indiscriminately, not eating enough behavioral things. But are, are they any more guilty than the person who has an endocrine problem? I don't think so. I think we just need to be more aware and raise the health literacy so that we can help those people get through their problem and become healthier. And I ask my colleagues. I just want to say one word about the environment uh, because I think the environment is incredibly important in shaping those personal decisions that you <clears throat> might or might not make. Um, the environment supports them or constrains them. And that it's the environment that really has changed that's brought us to this epidemic situation that we have today. And I therefore think it's the environment that we really have to address. So. Well, Admiral Car Carmona, panelists, thank you so much. Please join me in thanking them for their presentation <laughs> today. Thank you. Again, please be sure to join us in two weeks. Two weeks, uh, August 27th, here at the Governor Hotel uh, for Senator Slade Gorton and the 9-11 Commission Report. And we're adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>